Okay, so we want to start the lecture on trigonometry. We said trigonometry is the art of measuring in accessible objects or analyzing triangles. So this word itself is made out of three words. Try just means three. This means uh, knowledge and uh, this means geometry so we want to have a knowledge of measuring uh, triangles <clears throat> the objective the general objective for us in the course is that if you have some piece of information about a triangle how would you find other information typical information that we are interested in are the length of the sides typically we show them by say a b and c as well as the size of the angles that subtend these sides. So we have angle A that refers to angle here, angle B that refers to this one, and angle C here that refers to this. So at the most basic level, we have three sides and three, three angles. So six uh, pieces of information. By solving a triangle, we mean that some of these things are given and you want to try to find the other ones. That's the main holy grail for us for much of this course. And then we get started with the simple situation and we generally extend to the more uh, sophisticated cases later on. So first of all, we have the notion of an angle itself. We have. Uh, angle is a measure of the space between two lines so this is but what we mean by an angle the way we are going to measure it as you have learned in high school you can measure it in degrees and we are going to uh, learn how to measure it in other units as well sometimes when you are analyzing a shape you want to give the information about the angle itself sometimes you want to give information about the angle in terms of aspect ratio <clears throat> that idea means the following. Suppose you have an angle that you want to analyze. You make a right triangle out of this angle for yourself. So here's a right angle, meaning it's 90 degrees. <clears throat> and then I'll have these three sides. Let's call them A, B, and C. And the Let's call this angle, let's show it by the letter of theta. So th this is the symbol for theta, a Greek letter. They typically use it in these cases. So we can measure the angle directly uh, as we have learned in school, or we can talk about it in terms of ratio of the sides it makes. Now we have three sides. Out of these three sides, we can make six different ratios and each of those ratios have a name and that's what we want to introduce you to first so this is the beginning of trigonometric functions you said for example we can take the ratio of this side a to that other side c this is the hypotenuse. We refer to A and B as the legs. One of these legs is next to the angle that you are focusing on. We call it the adjacent leg. The other one is opposite of the, lang uh, the angle that you are looking at. We call it the opposite side or opposite leg. So I can consider the angle theta and say, well, what is the ratio of the adjacent leg to the hypotenuse? That's going to be A over C one way of talking about this angle in terms of the ratio of these two. Another one that I can take a look at is the ratio of the opposite to the hypotenuse. So let's uh, write it. A was our adjacent and C is our hypotenuse. B was our opposite side and C again is our hypotenuse. <clears throat> 
these ratios have their own names the ratios depend on what angle is it that you are focusing on so yesterday we talked about it what was the name of the ratio of adjacent to the hypotenuse that was the cosine so we write it as cosine of theta sometimes when things are get more complicated we put our angle inside the parentheses and that is the more official way of referring to this if I talk about this angle in terms of the ratio of the opposite to hypotenuse what would that one be called <coughs> sine of theta what in photography passes as aspect ratio is a ratio of opposite to the adjacent for example when you talk about the screens of uh, monitors you buy they talk about 16 to 9 ratios or 4 over 3 ratios and such that is a ratio of this height to this uh, width and in that case we have ratio of b to a so that's going to be opposite and that is going to be adjacent what was the name of that one that is tangent of theta now we can take the opposite of these ratios as well that is I could have taken a ratio of hypotenuse to adjacent let me write it just in front of it c over a that is going to be hypotenuse to adjacent and that is going to be secant of theta so secant of an angle is a ratio of the hypotenuse that it makes by the adjacent side if I take the hypotenuse to the opposite what is that one called cosecant of theta and then finally if I take a ratio of adjacent to the opposite that's going to be cotangent of theta so these are the six trig functions to understand them well we need to know the concept of functions from college algebra so I let, uh, left some uh, links for you that you can go and uh, refresh your memory about uh, functions and more importantly inverse functions that we are going to need pretty soon so <coughs> make sure you follow this that this is just a name that tells us what we are doing with our angle so cosine of a theta it simply means take the ratio of just draw the angle make a right triangle out of it then measure the adjacent measure the hypotenuse take the ratio that's what we mean by cosine of theta so pretty extensive things that you're supposed to do <coughs> in mathematics sometimes we use notation that could be confusing so sometimes you might look at this thing and judging from uh, what you have done back in uh, middle school where one letter followed by another letter meant that you are multiplying them you might be inclined to thinking that you are taking something called COS and multiplying it by theta no that's not what we mean here this is a name of a function and this is the so-called argument of the function you are applying a set of activity to this angle which you call it cosine it has nothing to do with multiplying one thing with another thing so make sure you don't have that misunderstanding in your mind there is no meaning of multiplication implied anywhere here in the notation for trig functions now let's go ahead just practice this on one of the most uh, famous triangles that uh, has been there in human history one of the most famous is the following it has a length of three on one side one of the legs is three the other leg is four and what would the hypotenuse be so this is three this is four if this is 3 that is 4 the, the length of the hypotenuse is equal to what 5 how do we know that let's just briefly refresh our mind about the Pythagorean theorem the most famous uh, theorem in mathematics it says if you have a right triangle whose legs are a and b and its hypotenuse is c then 
there is a relationship between these three legs. That relationship says c squared is equal to what? a squared plus b squared. And conversely, if you have three numbers, positive numbers, with this relationship, you can make a right triangle out of it. So the idea really goes both ways. So in case you have one leg and you have another leg, and you want to find the, the hypotenuse, you can write this relationship. You can say c squared is equal to 3 squared plus 4 squared. So that's 9 plus 16, that is 25. Say so square of some number is 25. What is that number? We have really two choices, positive and negative 5, plus or minus 5. But all of our measurements for the time being are positive measurements. So C just turns out to be 5. So this mystery of how come 3 and 4 leads to a 5 here is answered by the Pythagorean theorem, a theorem that was known to all the ancient cultures. Chinese, Egyptians, uh, Greeks, uh, from several thousand years ago, they knew about this. And even today, uh, the carpenters use this thing for making uh, right triangles, or creating squares, as they say. Uh, sorry. Now, let's take this and practice just writing the trig functions. So suppose this is 3, this is 4, this is 5. I call this angle theta. So let me ask you, what is cosine of theta? Oh. Yeah, we want to practice this so many times until it becomes second nature and quick. That is, it has to happen within a fraction of a second that cosine of theta. In this picture, is the ratio of adjacent to hypotenuse. Notice uh, when you say adjacent just means is attached to the angle itself. <coughs> has no connection to being horizontal or vertical or anything like that. It has to be attached to the angle you're talking about. So who is sine of theta? 4 over 5. Who is tangent of theta? 4 over 3. Who is uh, secant of theta? 5 over 3. Who is cosecant of theta? 5 over 4. Who is uh, cotangent of theta? OK. While you are here, notice that uh, these are just reciprocal of those things. So for that reason, to reduce the clutter, most often people uh, just focus on these three. Your, uh, Calculator has just a button for these three, and you have to do some additional activities by yourself to figure out the other functions. So we call these things primary trig functions. These are the secondary trig functions. Most of the time, we are going to, when we are running out of time or we want to abbreviate things, we just talk about these three. But in the long run, anybody who is doing quantitative stuff is going to have to live with these as well. And we are going to give an example where cotangent turns out to be a natural thing to do. But before uh, uh, going to the next issue, let me ask you to do the following problem. Suppose this is 5, this is 12. First of all, what is the length of the hypotenuse? How do you find out that it is 13? You say c squared is 5 squared plus 12 squared. So 25 plus 144. So 169. Positive square root or the positive answer of this equation is 13. So that turns out to be 13. Now let's uh, choose this angle, call it say alpha. Let's go ahead and practice. What is cosine of alpha? Uh -huh. The adjacent, now is this one, 12 over 13. What is sine of alpha? 5 over 13. Problems like these, you don't need to use your calculator to give a decimal number. That decimal number is not going to be as pretty as this one. So we try to keep this. Uh, rational answers just as rational answers instead of replacing it by a number with two decimals and such which 
are actually harder to play with. How about tangent of alpha? So opposite of this is 5 and adjacent is 12. Try to do these things yourself. So secant of alpha. We can do one of two things. We can just take this fraction and turn it upside down. That's actually one of our identities. Or we can say hypotenuse divided by adjacent. So cosecant of alpha, uh, same way, cosecant is going to be And then cotangent of alpha, that's going to be ratio of 12 over 5. So we have on our, our first uh, set of identities. Uh, these are called reciprocal identities. What that means is that we notice that secant is always reciprocal of cosine, regardless of what angle you got. This is true. Secant of alpha is 1 over cosine of alpha. So if I take a reciprocal of this, I get that. Similarly, I take a reciprocal of this one, I'm going to get that one. So you could also say cosine of alpha is 1 over secant of alpha. If you want to treat both of them on the same side, you can say cosine of alpha times secant of alpha is equal to 1. So let's write these things as a reciprocal. Reciprocal simply means taking a fraction and flipping it over. Same thing applies for cosecant of alpha. That is 1 over sine of alpha. Or you can say this is reciprocal of that. So the relationship goes both ways. Or you can say that if I take this, multiply by that, 5's cancel, 13's cancel, you get 1. Sine of alpha times cosecant of alpha, that is 1. Round 3, you tell me what to write here. What is cotangent of alpha? 1 over tangent of alpha. The other side of the coin says tangent of alpha is 1 over cotangent of alpha. The other version of it is tangent of alpha over cotangent of alpha is equal to 1. Now you want to have these things in a, some, a neat fashion in some corner of a page that you list all the identities but it actually has to be in back of your mind so that you can quickly go uh, through the choices that you have and build your strategies when you come to uh, more sophisticated identities. <coughs> so uh, let's go back here. We have these things, perhaps you want to call them primary functions. And then we have, uh, uh, you might perhaps call these things reciprocal functions. And <clears throat> make sure you know the difference between. OK. Uh, then uh, last time. We talked about some uh, famous angles. There's a long list of famous angles, and one of the very famous theorems of geometry relate to this. But right now, uh, let's say famous angles are uh, angles of certain uh, regular polygons the ones that you um, come across first are the 45 degree angle and then 30 degree angle and 60 degree angle. Later on you are going to talk about 0 and 90 degrees as well. So where do you see 45 degrees? For example when you draw an octagon you see plenty of angles that are 45 degrees. Or simpler than that if you have a right triangle 
where the sides, the legs, are of equal length. So these two are the same. Question is, what would be the size of the angle here? We reason out like this, that first of all, in any general triangle, sum of all angles is equal to what? Sum of all angles of a flat triangle is 180 degrees. One of the basic ideas in so-called flat geometry. If you have any triangle, regardless of what shape you got, sum of all these angles is 180 degrees. Let me just quickly remind you where does that come from. Somewhere in geometry classes you learn to draw a line parallel to one of these sides and say that these two, what did you call these two angles? If these two lines are parallel to each other and you have a transversal, you had a name for these two and a property for those. What, what would you call them? Alternate? Maybe you forgot. Alternate uh, transversal angles or whatever it is. These two angles are congruent or they are equal to each other. Similarly, how about this one and this one? They are congruent. Now, the sum of this green, red, and the blue angles, sum of all three of them is equal to what? Yeah, that is this straight angle here, the angle on this uh, green line, sum of all three of them becomes 180. That means the sum of angles of any triangle is 180 degrees. Okay, that's fact one. Fact two is when you're talking about a right triangle, you mean that this angle is how much? 90 degrees. So if this is 90 and all of them is 180 total, the sum of the other two is going to be what? Okay, sum of them is going to be 90 and since they are equal to each other, each of them is going to be 45 degrees. So again, if you have an isosceles right triangle, meaning this leg and that leg are the same, as a result, these two angles will be the same and since the sum of them is 90 degrees, each of them is going to be 45. So, to cut the chase and coming to the main conclusion, if you have this type of a setup, this angle is going to be 45 degrees. Now, we want to write down the six trig functions of 45. We start by the following argument. We say, okay, suppose you have some length for this. Suppose that length is A. Since this is the same as this length, then that has to be A as well. Now we let's try to find out the hypotenuse. So we just learned from Pythagorean theorem that the hypotenuse squared is sum of the square of the first one and the second one. Now something plus itself means twice that thing. Now if I want to take square root of this, I use this fact from algebra that I can break my square root to pieces. If I have one number multiplied by another number, I can take square root of each of them separately and then multiply later on. Now square root of a squared, we know that from algebra is what? a. a. And then I have radical 2 that I need to multiply by. So this c turns out to be a radical 2. So we use the Pythagorean theorem to say that if this is isosceles, a right triangle, then the hypotenuse is radical 2 times either of these two legs. Next, now let's go ahead and write the six trig functions. The easiest one to write is tangent. I don't have to deal with the hypotenuse at all. It's a ratio of opposite to adjacent. We notice that all the a's is going to cancel. The trig functions don't depend on how big of a triangle you use. Regardless of what a, what size you have here, you get the same answer. Okay, tangent was straightforward. Let's go to cosine. 
cosine of 45 is a ratio of adjacent to hypotenuse. So I have adjacent A, hypotenuse A radical 2. A is cancel out, and I'm left with what? 1 over square root of 2. So in uh, algebra, you learn about rationalization. You can take this, multiply by something that makes the radical disappear from denominator at the expense of showing up somewhere else. So I multiply by radical 2 over radical 2, which is just 1. So what happens? 1 times radical 2 is just radical 2. What is radical 2 times radical 2? That's just 2. So cosine of 45, you remember it as 1 over radical 2 as well as radical 2 over radical 2. Let's try round 3. Sine of 45. But as a ratio of opposite to the hypotenuse. Luckily, we have just done this, so we don't need to rehash it. So these are the three primary functions. How about the reciprocal function? Let's go ahead. Cotangent of 45. Ratio of adjacent to the opposite, or just a reciprocal of that, which is just 1. Now let's go to the secant. Secant is a ratio of hypotenuse to the adjacent. So that's going to be a radical 2 to a, and that simplifies just to radical 2. Or you can take the reciprocal of this, radical 2 over 1, you just write it as radical 2. Same story with cosecant of 45. Same answer, turns out to be radical 2. So again, in one of your neat pages on your notebook, you need to have a table, a table that's going to look like this. You have certain angles. You have the trig function. Your angles are going to be 0, 30, 45, 60, and 90. Here you have your functions, for example, sine, cosine, tangent, uh, let's write it in the same order, so this cosecant, the next one is going to be secant, and the next one is going to be cotangent, and then let's see if we can rattle it off now, 45, what was the sign of that? Where to? Cosine, same, tangent, 1, cosecant, Okay, one of the initial challenges that you have is to fill up this table quickly in a matter of less than uh, 30 seconds. Uh, make sure you understand all the components of it. Once again, your notebook is going to be of a secondary use. It's not something that you want to rely on for everything you want to do because then you are going to run out of time on the exam. Your notebook is just for cases that you have a little bit of doubt about something. It's not that something that you want to use as a crutch on every single step. So let's be clear about that. We don't want to have any misunderstanding. Uh, you need to have speed. Okay. Uh, let's take a couple of minutes of break and we come back and talk about uh, other two angles and then move on to the next topic.